today's lecture is more about structure. So here is our chart of how all of those elements of causal plot structure might look if we were to plot it all out on a graph. So this is a little bit different looking than what many of you have probably seen in other analysis or literature classes. This right here is called Freytag's Pyramid. And Freytag was a 19th century German writer who wrote about dramatic structure, among other things. And this tends to get used a lot in literature classes. Um, my only thing is, right, this is a very stable looking diagram. And it's almost like every part is the same. We've got a chunk of exposition and inciting force or what we would call the inciting incident we've got rising action a climax in the middle falling action and then what freytag calls the resolution and then the denouement which is all that wrapping up the ends right so lots of the same elements but i have an issue with how freytag kind of apportions um the amount of time and kind of where in the chronology he puts things I think it's stupid to put the climax in the middle because if the climax is the most exciting part, then once we reach the middle, the rest of the play is falling action or less exciting, less intense, right? So why would we stick around? We wouldn't. But I don't think Freytag is completely out of touch. I do think that the middle point of a play or a movie should be exciting. Um, and so instead of the climax as being the midpoint, I like to think of that midpoint as kind of a major turning point in the plot. Something big happens, you know, the stakes get higher or the obstacles get bigger, or sometimes the protagonist kind of has a come to Jesus moment or dark night of the soul where, where things start to go off in a new direction. But things don't get less exciting from the midpoint on. The tension keeps on rising, the action keeps happening, and the climax happens in that final scene or next to final scene of the play. And that's where our big payoff is. So unlike Freytag that gives about, you know, 30% of the plot structure over to rising action, I give it about 75%, right? And so that means there's a lot kind of meat in the middle of that. And so let's talk about some ways we can unpack that rising action. If you remember from earlier lectures on acting and plot structure, right? This is all about objectives and obstacles and tactics. Our protagonist has their super objective that they're trying to achieve, and we don't know if they're gonna achieve it until we get to that climax, but all along the way, they're gonna have smaller objectives that are gonna help them towards achieving that super objective. And so I like to think of the rising action as kind of like those stepping stones, those dominoes, right? The metaphors we've been using before. So you can think of rising action as a series of complications right? Obstacles or other forces that are preventing the protagonist from achieving their goal. And sometimes those complications can really, uh, you know, loom large and things can look pretty grim for the protagonist. And so we'd call that kind of a moment a crisis. And so I tend to think of what Freytag calls the climax, I call it the crisis. And it's kind of the first pink peak in a two hump uh, upward trajectory, where the second peak is the climax at the end. Some other ways we can kind of mix up this rising action is to have moments of discovery, right? And you've seen this in any kind of TV show or movie, right? Where new information is revealed to characters and that impacts the plot. Oh my God, it turns out you have a secret twin. Oh my God, it turns out the person I thought was the murderer has an alibi, right? On, on, and on. Sometimes we might have a reversal, which is like, you know, banging a Yui, turning a 180. We have a real sudden change of direction in the plot. And this happens all the time in police procedurals and, you know, crime dramas like Law and Order or Criminal Minds, right? Everything we thought was happening and was true suddenly gets kind of the rug pulled out from under us. And we got to kind of rethink, regroup and go in a different direction. We still want to serve our ultimate goal of achieving our super objective, but we've got to completely change tactics now. Or to complicate things still further, we might have subplots right under the action, which means that there might be other storylines or lines of actions that are separate from or intertwined with the main action. And they may resolve at the climax or a little bit before, or they're kind of like all intertwined there. And 
lots of times they're impacting the action of the protagonist in their journey. Okay. So eventually all of that rising action, those complications, if there's a reversal or a crisis or discovery um, or subplots, eventually it all kind of, you know, reaches that moment of climax. And then we have our falling action. Again, Freytag devotes, you know, 30 to 40 percent of the plot to falling action. I give it like five to 10. So sometimes that falling action is very straightforward. Sometimes it all makes sense. And then sometimes it's a little bit kind of forced. Um, so there's this term called the deus ex machina, which is Latin, and it literally translates as God from the machine, which is kind of a cool uh, punk band name, right? But so what it means is that in ancient Greek theater, there was this piece of scenery, like some scene machinery, and it was kind of, we think, like a basket on a crane. And what it could do is like literally lower actors from high above the stage space, into the stage. And so they'd look like, you know, gods on clouds ready to hurl thunderbolts or, you know, driving their chariot across the sky. And when that moment happened, right, it was a big, exciting moment. It normally happened at the climax. And the gods would be like, basically, forget it. I'm going to fix this, hurl my thunderbolt. Ta da, problem solved. Um, today, we don't have many gods hurling thunderbolts, but we do use this phrase deus ex machina as when the ending of the play is a little bit too convenient or kind of comes out of nowhere, like, you know, pulled it out of your uh, back pocket, right? It doesn't always truly satisfy, but it does wrap things up in a hurry. Another route we could go, which I think Aristotle would have really hated, but we could choose to have a cliffhanger ending, right? And when the cliffhanger ending means that there is no falling action, there is no denouement, there is no wrapping up of loose ends. There's no falling action, right? The play ends at the climax. And when that happens, the outcome is deliberately unclear. The MDQ doesn't get answered, right? Lots of Hollywood movies love to end with a cliffhanger because they're gonna write a sequel and we'll all come back for more. Um, sometimes, you know, serial TV shows end with a cliffhanger so that you'll tune in next week. and some standalone plays and movies also end with a cliffhanger because they they want to deliberately unsettle the audience. They want you walking away from it going, God, I don't know. Did they make it? Did they not? I don't know. So this is kind of a modern twist on Aristotle's old causal plot structure, but one we uh, are very uh, enamored with. And then here's one more variation on causal or linear structure. Remember, linear structure means things happen in chronological order. Causal structure, things happen in chronological, chronological order where one event causes the next event to happen. Well, we can kind of throw a little monkey wrench in that and have a flashback. That is when we're deliberately breaking the chronological order and we're skipping back to an earlier point in time to reveal new information. The Greeks wouldn't have done this. They would have found that offensive. Um, I don't really think Shakespeare does that either. Normally how they would handle this is they would have a character come on stage, you know, a messenger, a friar, right? Or some other character who would reveal like, oh yeah, well back 20 years ago, this thing really happened and nobody knew about it until now, right? Today in movies and um, TV shows and sometimes even in live plays, we write a scene where the characters are, are you know, playing out events from an earlier moment in time. Okay, I wanna take a couple moments to just show you a couple of variations on causal structure, um, because why be simple when you can have choices? So one way that you can do a causally structured play is to have a climactic plot structure. So this is climactic, not climatic just like it's causal, not casual. And if we were going to plot a climatically structured play out on a graph, this is what it might look like. So we have that kind of lopsided pyramid shape, which is not like Freytag's, um, but does kind of maintain some of those trace elements. And so here are some elements of that climactic plot structure. So you can see, right, with that long flat line at the beginning, there's a point of attack that happens late in the story of the characters, right? Which means there's lots of exposition for characters to reveal in some way. And then the uh, 
inciting incident, which is that second dot at the bottom there, is going to happen pretty quickly after the point of attack. We then have very swift, very sharp rising action, a very explosive climax, and very little falling action before we reach our new stasis. I kind of overdrew that line. I think that line of falling action could be even shorter to make this more clear. But you get my point, right? It's, it's a simple graph. It's a simple plot. It kind of takes off running and never lets you go until you get to that climax. And we've just seen that. The plot of Antigone, it's simple, it's focused, and intense. Other things about climactic structure is that it tends to take very little time in the lives of the characters, right? So a play like Antigone, all of the action happens in the course of one day. The cast tends to be small. That's true in the case of Antigone. Um, the number of locations or different settings tend to be few. Antigone basically is in one place, right? The production that we saw cheated a little bit by having that passageway for that first scene, but the bulk of the action is happening in Creon's war room. And all of these things are hallmarks of climactic structure. Keep it simple, stupid. Okay, so the Greeks really like climactic structure. They kind of turn that into their art form, but that's not the only way to do a climactic structure. You could have an episodic plot structure, and this was a style that was more favored by Shakespeare. So check out this graph. So the differences, right? The point of attack is gonna maybe happen earlier in the story of the characters. The rising action is going to be more complicated, right? There are more complications. And what that means is that the rising action is gonna be a little bit more gradual. And I mean to say slow, but it's gonna be a little bit more jagged and windy getting there instead of like this kind of rocket ride straight to the top. We still have that climax as the highest point of the action, but it's kind of less sudden to get there. And we might have more falling action. There are gonna be more loose ends to wrap up. I said Shakespeare really liked this style of structure and uh, Hamlet is a good example of it, right? If you've seen Hamlet or read Hamlet, you know a lot happens in Hamlet. The, the super objective is Hamlet needs to try and avenge his father's murder, but there's so much that happens in between. There's more murder, there's political intrigue, there's sex, there's violence, there's madness, there's suicide, there's a funeral, there's an impending war, there's a play that goes wrong, and oh my god, there's someone gets a, uh, ambushed by pirates and kidnapped. Crazy, right? So point is, it's complicated. It takes a long time for Hamlet to answer that major dramatic question, but that's still the focus of the play. And so other differences between episodic and climactic structure. With an episodic structure, you're going to have a bigger cast, right? Because all of those complications, you need more people. More time is going to pass in the lives of the characters. A play like Hamlet seems to take several months for the characters to live through. Um, other episodically structured plays, um, like Shakespeare's The Winter Tale, there's 15 years that elapses between the beginning and the end of the play. Um, and there will be more locations, right? Scenes take place in different places in an episodically structured plot. Okay, and another thing that could happen is we have a parallel plot or a subplot structure where there's one main story and then one or two or three more kind of minor stories that are intertwined. And each of those subplots are going to have their own beginning, middle, and end, their own rising action and falling action, but they're all going to be kind of subservient to that main plot. I don't know if there are any musical fans out there, but a play like Les Miserables is a good example of a play with subplots. The main storyline is that of Jean Valjean, who's a guy that served 20 years for stealing a loaf of bread. He's out of prison and he's trying to redeem his life. And that is what's driving him throughout the play. Um, Meanwhile, there are lots of stories going on. Um, there's a woman who finds herself trying to raise a child on her own in 19th century France, and um, she ends up turning to prostitution, and then she gets sick and she dies. Well, she turns her baby over to Jean Valjean to raise. Um, later on, that child grows up. She falls in love with a guy named Marius. There's another girl in Eponine who's also in love with Marius, so there's a little love triangle there. Meanwhile, said Marius, while he's kind of fighting off the affections of these two girls, is also trying to decide whether or not he should join a um, student-led rebellion where they're trying to overthrow the government. 
Um, there are a couple of characters in there that are just trying to find any way they can to lie, cheat, steal their way to the top of the social ladder. And there's a guy who is trying to find Jean Valjean and bring him back to justice because Jean Valjean broke parole, right? So again, it's complicated, not unlike Hamlet, but there are kind of several different plot lines that are going on there. Not all of them are about Jean Valjean, but each of these little plot lines interact with Jean Valjean's storyline and he has to kind of absorb the pieces of them as he makes his way towards serving his own super objective. But wait, there's more. So like I said, most plays we're familiar with are going to be causally structured, either climactic or episodic, or they might have subplots, right? But this is a tradition that we in America in the 21st century and Europe have received from um, the ancient Athenians. But that doesn't mean it's the only way to structure a play. So let's explore some of those. Okay, we can use repetition as a structure. And what I mean by this is that when something could be a line of dialogue, a specific action, or a song, or you know, some sort of imagery on the stage um, gets repeated, the more times it gets repeated, it starts to take on greater significance. And so there are lots of different plays that kind of use that to make a structure. Suzanne Laurie Parks, we're going to read another play by her later uh, this year, but she has a play called America Play, um, in which there's a black man who looks like Abraham Lincoln, and he gets, quote, assassinated repeatedly throughout the action of this play. Each time he's assassinated, we're starting to, like, ask new questions. Or maybe you've seen a movie like Crash or Pulp Fiction. Um, crash is about a car crash and it impacts many different people. You know, the people involved in the crash, the witnesses, the police officer who's investigating it, the family members, you name it, right? So we see this one event um, kind of repeated from several different angles. So we see the same actions over and over again. But each time that crash repeats, we're seeing it from different points of view, the perspective of the police officer, the perspective of the driver, the perspective of the bystander. And so each time the kind of crash repeats itself, we get more information and we learn something new about what went wrong and whose fault it is and what it all means. So it's a little bit different than a chronological cause and effect structure, right? Because we're breaking that linear structure and um, by repeating things, one thing isn't causing the next thing to happen necessarily. Other plays and films that do this well, right? Think about Groundhog Day with Bill Murray's character who's doomed to live that same day over and over and over again, or a um, play called Waiting for Godot, um, in which case it's sort of like the original Seinfeld. It's a show about nothing. Nothing happens a few times over. These characters find themselves repeating the same routines and actions as they're waiting for Godot to appear. Okay, so we could also have situational structure where instead of following this chronological cause and effect order, we've got a play that's revolving around a moment or event. So unlike Crash, where the event is the central force, but we're repeating that event over and over again, think about a, a movie like Love Actually, right? Which is several different vignettes or stories um, all about love and relationships happening at Christmas time. And there is some overlap with these stories, right? Because some of the characters know each other, but each character is kind of living out their own storyline. Um, and they, their actions don't really impact each other's storylines. There's no real cause and effect between the storylines. They're just kind of in the background. But here we're not seeing the same event play out over and over again. We're just seeing, you know, here's Tuesday, the lives of these characters, and each of their own stories has their own arcs. Or you could take a play like Twilight Los Angeles, which came out in the early 90s. This was a one-woman show by Anna Devere Smith. She interviewed some 300 people in Los Angeles. This was after the beating of the motorist Rodney King and then the trial of the police officers who beat him and their acquittal and the riots that ensued. And so Anna Devere Smith interviewed hundreds of people to really get their sense on what they thought about the beatings, the trial, the riots, racism, where we go from here. And out of those 300 interviews, she 
turned it into a play where she plays 40 different characters. So they're, you know, police officers, they're Korean store owners, they're, you know, teenage African-American kids, they're, um, you know, you name it, people from all walks of life that live in LA and thinking about this. So instead of one story with a beginning, a middle and an end, we're trying to get the sense of events from what these multiple diverse people think about it. So this is also kind of structure by idea. Instead of telling a story with beginning, middle, and end, we're going to explore an idea from different viewpoints. Whereas um, uh, the Anna Devere Smith piece is really focused on an event, we can focus on more abstract things like an idea. So here are some examples. Embrace yourselves. I'm going to say the word vagina a few times. Okay, there's a play by Eve Ensler called The Vagina Monologues, and it pretty much is self-explanatory. You can have, you know, a different sized cast depending on how you want to do it, um, but it's a series of monologues based on interviews, kind of like Anna Devere Smith, but it's all about women how they feel about their bodies, how they feel about sex, what kind of experiences they have had. And it's all about, you know, like the only thing these women have in common is that they have a vagina. And what has that meant to them? How, what does it mean to be a woman? What does it mean to be a sexual being? What does having a vagina mean in society today? So there isn't one story. The women in these monologues don't necessarily know each other. They don't interact with each other. Their stories don't impact each other's. Um, but over the course of listening to the several dozen of them, you start to kind of have a collective understanding of what it might mean to be a woman in the early 21st century. Another example is uh, one of my favorite plays called The Notebooks of Leonardo da Vinci by Mary Zimmerman. And what she did is right, Leonardo da Vinci, Italian inventor, painter, writer, physicist, man, you know, who kind of knew a lot about everything. And he kept notebooks where he would write anything from, you know, a recipe for lentil soup to how to get the correct perspective in a painting to, you know, hmm, I wonder if I could invent wings so that people could fly to, oh my God, I can't believe my servant today. He, he was so lazy. He was late. He didn't do the things I wanted him to do. Um, you name it. It all kind of went down in his, in his notebooks. And so what Mary Zimmerman does with this piece is instead of telling a story where we have, you know, Da Vinci having a super objective that he's trying to pursue and encountering obstacles along the way. She's just literally pulling pages out of Da Vinci's notebooks and trying to act them out. And this picture here, you can see the actors with these kind of strings around their heads. They're, they're setting up um, how to um, compose a painting and that Da Vinci was talking about in one of the pages of his notebooks. So it's kind of just like taking a walk through Da Vinci's mind and bringing it to life in front of you. Or we could structure a plot by character. I don't know if any of you have ever seen this movie. It's called I'm Not There. And it's about Bob Dylan, right? Famous folk artist. But instead of being a traditional biopic like, um, you know, um, Rocket Man or um, the one about Queen, was it We Will Rock You? I can't even remember. Um, anywho, right? In this movie, the character of Bob Dylan is played by six different actors. You can see them there. You notice that not all of them look particularly like Bob Dylan. Um, and the reason why these six actors are playing Bob Dylan instead of one is because the writer said, well, I want to bring out different facets of Dylan's life and his personality and career. And so I wanted different actors to really kind of lift up those different facets. So this movie isn't really in chronological order either. It's not like, you know, here's young Dylan, here's teenage Dylan, here's, you know, Dylan in his twenties, middle-aged Dylan and old Dylan. It's um, organized by facets of his personality. Or we could have structure by place. So maybe if you've done high school theater or community theater, you've seen this play. This is Plaza Suite by Neil Simon. And it's a three act play. Each act tells the story of a couple who has rented the Plaza Suite at the Plaza Hotel in New York City. Right. So three different weekends, three different couples, three different stories. So each act is kind of its own little causally structured piece in the lives of each of these characters. But the three acts put together, it's really about the suite. 
And little fun fact for you, these images here are from um, the Broadway production that was supposed to open last March, starring Matthew Broderick and Sarah Jessica Parker. So that's the two of them in each of these three photos playing the couples in each of the acts. Um, it was put on hold because of COVID, but it's supposed to be uh, brought to Broadway in um, spring of 2021. So maybe we'll get to see it. Last one I want to talk about is deconstruction. This is when you take a known story or a play and you kind of literally take it apart and put it back together in a new way. So could be something as simple as like Wicked is in some ways deconstructing the story of the Wizard of Oz, telling it from a different perspective, putting it back together in a new way. Or Maybe you've heard of Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead, which is uh, a play written by Tom Stoppard. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are two minor characters in Hamlet. They show up in like act two. Uh, they're there for about an act and then they disappear. Um, and Tom Stoppard wrote a play like, what if, what if we heard the Hamlet story from their perspective? What is going on with them? Um, so this new work that you're making out of the old work by reconstructing it, um, it's commenting on or it's responding to that original work, but it's not really going to necessarily be true to the original work. It's kind of like looking at it out of the side of your eye. So as you can see, lots of different ways to tell stories, lots of different ways to arrange beads on necklaces, lots of different ways to make meaning out of lives, events, and ideas.